Well, good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to our virtual church service today. Here is our program for today, which we actually changed from what we had planned for in, in our church sanctuary being live there. Max was going to be playing for us today, so we felt it appropriate to use a recording of Max still playing for us today. Our hymn of praise, come Christians join to sing. Martha Jean will have scripture and Rick will have our prayer. The choir is gonna sing for us today. I changed the sermon for today being on Zoom versus in the sanctuary and I'll give you more detail about that a little bit later. And we will conclude with Sweet, Sweet Spirit and our postlude. And since we're on Zoom, I thought we could spend some time with the greatest impact conversation in our virtual fellowship. One of the things that we haven't been able to do a lot of in, in fellowship, especially with those that are online. So it'd be kind of neat to, for y'all to stay with us and have some conversation after the fact. Nice. Thank you. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for the blessing of Zoom. We're able to join fellowship. Meet. We ask you to Give us all the touch that you lay down on us, Father. We ask you to guide the pastor as he brings the message forward, that everybody on Zoom and anybody within here in distance will be pleased with the sound, knowing that you're out there, Father. In these hard times, we need all you we can get. There's just too many churches being closed daily, Father. The message of a house divided is so strong because it seems that the churches are the ones that are falling. So we ask you to lay your hands down on us all. We ask you to look after the ones that requested prayer 
all the silent prayers, Father. We ask you especially to help the homeless that's out there in tents in this cold, bitter days. We just ask all these things in the name of our Father, our Son, and our Holy Ghost. And amen. So let's pause for prayer. Father God, now we come to you again, that time in our service when you speak directly to us through your word and through your servant. Lord, just be with me, you know, the challenges of technology, you know, all that has had to happen to make this happen today. Lord, we know that your hand is in everything that we do. Be with each person that is hearing this sermon now and those that will hear it when it's in the archives and YouTube. May each person be blessed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The sermon title is The Three Ps of the Holy Spirit. A little bit later in the sermon, you will learn what the three Ps are. I just want to start with just talking a little bit about that term, the Holy Spirit. And I suspect that most Christians have heard the term the Holy Spirit. Most have even said the words Holy Spirit. Some may have a very vague, perhaps a rather vacuous idea of who the Spirit of God really is and what he's supposed to do in their lives. They've heard preachers talk about it. They've, they've heard other Christians talk about it. They know the words Holy Spirit, but that's sadly about as deep as it gets for many people. The Holy Spirit isn't real in their lives in a real dynamic way. And for some, when you mention that term, the Holy Spirit, there are those who think, uh-oh. Some even equate it with speaking in tongues. So I'm hoping over this next half hour, we can gain some clarity. We can give some clarity to this really important topic. So I'm gonna start with the story. I like stories. You know, I think it gives us something to take home and remember. It was, a, it was a typical Sunday in a community church, typical Sunday school class. They'd been studying the Apostles' Creed and now the idea was to have each child say one part of that that they had committed to memory. And then the next child would pick up on the next line and so on and so forth, they would go through the creed. Well, that Sunday came. 
for the time for the class to do what the teacher had asked them to do. And she says, okay, class, go for it. So that one little boy, the first boy, he stands up and he begins, I believe in one God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. He did his part. He sat down, a little girl stood up next, and she said, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our Lord. And she sat down. There was a long silence. The kids looked around at each other rather uncomfortably. And finally, one little girl stood up and said to the teacher, I'm sorry, but the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit is absent today. That story makes me think, I wonder if it could be said of a lot of people. Those who believe in the Holy Spirit are absent today. In fact, there are many believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who could be described much like the disciples in Ephesus when Paul visited them in Acts 19. Remember our study in Acts? You remember the first two verses of Acts 19? While wow, Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their answer, remember their answer? No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And sadly, there are a lot of believers like that. They can recite a creed. They can say, yes, I'm a Christian. But their response would be much the same as that day. We haven't so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer wrote, the idea of the Holy Spirit to the average church member is so vague as to be non-existent. So I submit to you today that the Holy Spirit is not vague and that it does exist. You see, the Bible mentions the Holy Spirit from cover to cover. It's everywhere in the Bible. You cannot get away from the subject of the Holy Spirit of God. The Old Testament mentions the Holy Spirit 90 times. The New Testament, over, six, over 260 times have been counted. 56 times in the Gospel, 57 times in the Book of Acts, 112 times in the Pauline Epistles, and 36 times in the remaining New Testament. So you see, we cannot escape the Holy Spirit. He is there from Genesis to Revelation. He's everywhere, which poses a problem. Where do you begin when you begin to study the Holy Spirit? Well, we can start in Genesis 1, verse 2, the very second verse of the Bible. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, hovered over the waters of creation. We can go to the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride come. Or we can go right there in the beginning of the New Testament, the very first mention of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1.18, and Mary was found with child by the Holy Spirit. But today we're going to spend some time looking in John, looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. John 14, verses 16 to 17. Where, when the second, per second person of the Trinity introduces the third person to his disciples, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there are two questions that come up. Is the Holy Spirit a person or a power? And the second question, is the Holy Spirit a dignitary or a deity? Have you ever thought about those questions? Well, let's try and answer the first one. Person or power. Is he a real person who leads unbelievers to Jesus Christ? Or is he just a force or a power? Or you might be thinking, well, it, does it really matter? Well, it does. Indeed, it does matter. And the short answer is, if you see the Holy Spirit as merely a force or a power, then you're going to be saying, I want more of the Holy Spirit. 
But if you see him, however, as a person, especially a divine person, you're going to be saying, I want the Holy Spirit to have more of me. And the difference is really in the results. In the results, that's where we see the difference. Theoretically, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. He's a person. He's God. That's theoretical. But do we actually think of him in that way? Or do we even think of him at all? So in answering the question, is he a person or a power? Well, let's look at those verses there in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now, if we skip on down to verse 25 and John 14, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, that's what Jesus said. And we can notice a few things about this. Three things, actually. There are some problems. There are some pronouns. And there's some personality questions here. There's the three Ps of the Holy Spirit. Problems, pronouns, and personality. We're going to look at all three. Problem number one, when we look at problems, there's a couple of problems. And the first one is a historical problem. Now, I want to bring these to your attention. We don't have time to go into every detail. But when we think of the historical problem, well, over time, we know there have been splinter groups throughout the history of the church that have, frankly, they have denied the personality of the Holy Spirit. And that question comes up frequently. There is the, the ongoing question and debate over the Trinity. And we've had some visitors in our church that have raised that question as to what we believe. But it seems to go all the way back from the very beginning. John Lloyd Ogilvie wrote something very interesting. Here's his statement. He said, sadly, many Christians settle for two thirds of God. God the Father is way up there somewhere, aloof and apart from their daily lives. Christ is out there somewhere between them and the Father. The Holy Spirit is some kind of vague force or impersonal power they hear about but they don't know intimately. So problem number one, historically. Denied by some, and that's a problem. But number two, it's also a biblical problem. And this is what I mean when I say a biblical problem. Did you ever notice as you read the Bible that sometimes the Bible describes the Holy Spirit in rather impersonal terms, as if he were an it? The word spirit in the Old Testament is Greek is ruach, which means literally, it means winds, the wind, or the holy breath or holy wind. In the New Testament, the word for spirit is pneuma, which is literally one's breath. It's really a neuter noun, meaning there's no gender. And that makes it easy to think the Holy Spirit really isn't a person. But we also see the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove, that mighty rushing wind at Pentecost. And he's described as appearing in a flame of fire at Pentecost. He is seen as oil in the New Testament. And now why all these impersonal descriptions if he is a person? Do you see the biblical problem here? Because the Bible is describing not his personality, as much as his activity in those things. We've got some great examples we can look at. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He called himself the door of salvation, the good shepherd. He's also referred to as a refuge or a rock, 
a consuming fire. Now those very terms right there, here's a really big word, anthropomorphic. Those are anthropomorphic terms. You see, and that's defined as any non-human character that will walk, talk, sing, or dance. Those are examples of anthropomorphism. And perhaps if we look at something very common today, those that like to go to Disney, we all know Disney and you think of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and Donald Duck, and I'm not comparing the Holy Spirit to them, but that's an example of anthropomorphism. Those are anthropomorphic animals. And we see the Holy Spirit described to us in the Bible with word pictures. These are metaphors that help us understand this magnificent being of the Holy Spirit, this magnificent being that we call God. So we have a historical problem, we have a biblical problem, but then there's also a personal problem. And you see that the minute we imagine that the Holy Spirit is a force, an impersonal power, rather than a person, we face a problem. Now, the more charismatic Christian, they will pray with phrases like, fill me with thy power, fill me with your spirit. Oh, I need more of the Holy Spirit. As if to imply God would put that power at their disposal. Can you imagine how detrimental it might be if simply at a whim, you could just speak things into existence by that power? So those are the problems that we encounter as we get into a more in-depth study of the Holy Spirit. We have historical and biblical and personal. But then we have pronoun issues. When we look at the pronouns, we look back at chapter 14, verse 26, you see on your screen there. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, you're in your Bibles, you mark that word, he, there's a pronoun, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Turn over a page in your Bible to chapter 15, verse 26. When the helper comes, who am I send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he, pronoun, will testify of me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. We can go to chapter 16 and verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In verse 13, however, when he, personal pronoun, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he, personal pronoun, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he speaks, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All told in this section of three verses. In this section in chapters 14, 15, and 16, there's 13 personal pronouns Jesus uses when he refers to the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but the last time I checked, and I think it still is this way, personal pronouns are used for people and not forces. Think about that. Imagine how weird it would sound if I said, oh, the wind is blowing today and the wind, oh, he is so strong. Or I need air in my tires and the air, he helps my car. You know, there is not one single reliable version of the Holy Scriptures where the Holy Spirit is referred to as an it. Every reliable scholarly work out there is the same thing. He, him, whom. Those are all personal pronouns. There's an issue of personality. You know, the names Jesus gives to the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, the counselor. Does that sound like power to you? Webster's Dictionary says, we apply the word to living beings only, possessed with a rational nature. In other words, to be a person, you need intelligence or mind, you need feelings or emotion, 
and you need a will. And all of the, and all of those three aspects of personality, the Holy Spirit exhibits all three. We look at chapter 14, verse 16, it says, he will teach. Chapter 15, verse 16, he will testify or speak. 16, verse 8, he will convict or convince, as some translations say. Chapter 16, verse 7, 13, he will guide, he will speak, he will tell. And verse 15, he will take and declare. So to answer that first question, person or power? And I see a mistake in my PowerPoint. The answer is person. It's a person. We see them as him as power, but he's a person. Moving on to the second question, the second of the two questions. Is the Holy Spirit a dignitary or deity? Is the Holy Spirit some important being like an angelic being? Or is, the, is he the Holy Spirit of God? Now, nothing will heighten your respect for the Holy Spirit than to realize he is God Almighty. So, dignitary, deity. Chapter 16, verse 12 gives us an answer. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth will come, he will guide you into all truth. Think about it, for the Holy Spirit to be able to guide you into all the truth, he has to be aware of all the truth. And to be aware of all the truth means that he is omniscient. He knows everything. Isn't that a description of God? The Holy Spirit, omniscient, omnipresent. David, he describes God very well in Psalm 139 says, where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? I can go anywhere. You're there. So the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He's omnipresent. We know that he was there at creation. We already looked at Genesis 1-2, hovering over the waters. Job 33, Job said, the spirit of God has made me. So the qualifications of his character, you see, really shows that he is God. We have some validations by Christ himself. And I will pray the Father and he will give you a, and notice here, it doesn't say helper, give says, give you another helper then he may abide with you forever. That's a key word in that verse another helper. Now in the Greek language, there are two words for the English word another. We have one word, the Greek has two. One word is allos, the other word is heteros. Allos means another of exactly the same sort, and heteros means another that's completely different. The word that Jesus used for another counselor is the word allos, one exactly like I have been to you. Jesus was the helper, the comforter, the counselor, the friend. He was the miracle worker. He was God in human flesh. And he was going, he was leaving. And he said, ah, oh, I'm going to send you a comforter, one just like me, allos. One who is divine, one who can help, one who can do and be it all that I have done and been to you. Allos, another comforter, another divine being. Now the early church, they understood that. Peter was there listening when that was said. Acts 5, you remember this from our study in Acts? But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds. Remember that story? His wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? 
and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Peter heard that. Paul did too. We have some examples here. Isaiah 6. You know that verse? In Isaiah 6, the Lord said, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am, Lord, send me. And so it says, The Lord said, God said, Go and say this message. We know Paul read that. And when Paul quotes it in Acts 28, it's at the end of the book. At the end of the book, the Holy Spirit was right when he said, and that's what he's quoting Isaiah 6, go and speak these words to the people. Isaiah said God was, God is speaking. Paul the apostle says it was the Holy Spirit speaking. So the conclusion of all of this the Holy Spirit is a person, not a power, a deity, not a dignity. So the Holy Spirit, along with the Father and the Son, is God Almighty in the Trinity. So perhaps we ask the question in our mind, does it matter that he is a person and that he is a divine person? I believe it's impossible for a man to despair who remembers that his helper is omnipotent. Think about that. Your helper is omnipotent. Your helper is omniscient. You go through life and you think about this Holy Spirit, you think about the Trinity, omnipotent, omniscient, everywhere, all knowing. So does it matter that he is a person and a deity? Yes, and I think it matters a whole lot. And you see, if you don't grasp who he is, you can't appreciate what he does. And if you don't understand his person, if you don't understand his personality, then you'll never appreciate all the activities of the Holy Spirit. Interesting quote. I like what A.C. Dixon wrote years ago. When you rely on organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely on education, we get what education can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we get what God can do. And you see, that's the difference. We get what God can do. Here's an interesting analogy for you to think about. The Holy Spirit is the transformer. You see, the Holy Spirit is ready to get a hold of you and use you right now. And that's what Jesus was telling these, these men on that night. Hey, I'm leaving, but good news, great news, really good news. Somebody's coming and he's going to teach you. He'll reveal to you. He'll impart to you. He'll be everything that I am and was to you. The Holy Spirit, like an electric transformer. We've all seen transformers on utility poles. And those transformers can take thousands of volts of electricity. And they can step it down into useful increments that we can hook lights in our house up to. Everything in our house works. You can't connect directly into that transformer. It's way too much power. We need those increments. The Holy Spirit is like a transformer. It's taking the truth of God, that mighty power, that truth, that life-changing ability of God, that mighty power, and it gives it to us in increments that we can handle in ways that will change us one step at a time and one day at a time. question for you. What do watches, cars, and Christians have in common? There's the answer. They're all powered by something. 
you know, watches don't tick, cars don't run, and Christians don't make a difference without what is on the inside. Watches need batteries. Years ago, you wind them, but they still need something to make them work. Cars need gas. Some today need batteries. But the Christian needs the Holy Spirit to make it run. And the Lord said, for a Christian, that's the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, well, today we have gained some insight here today to so many things about you and so many things about the Holy Spirit and this issue of the Trinity. Things, perhaps questions we've wondered about or we have gained a better understanding. And our prayer is that you help us to know who the Spirit is, what he does, and how we should respond. Lord, we're human. And at times we cannot fully grasp that which is infinite. We do ask that the Holy Spirit, that he would act as that transformer in us and that he would take the truth that Jesus said, and the disciples, they had so much to learn and give us that truth in those increments that we can handle, increments that are life-changing day by day and that we will be transformed from glory to glory into that same image by the Spirit of the Lord. And Lord, today we pray that we want our relationship with you to include the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And until we get to heaven, we know we're never going to fully grasp how this all works. But our prayer is that you help us get a better handle on that person of the Spirit, the deity that includes your Spirit, so that we will never despair and they will, we will have the courage to go forward in faith. And as Christians, we will have that power inside us to make us work for you. We pray all this now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, all oh, the words of that song, sweet Holy Spirit, fill us, Lord, 
And as we go our different ways today, may we know and be reminded and remember that we have the grace of God and the peace of Jesus. And know that each of us is greatly blessed, highly favored, and perfect, but a forgiven child of God. We were church, I would say, please be seated. You probably are. <laughs> 